Hello. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Thank you to, for being here for the first lecture. We are organizing this, this course. We have the pleasure to start with Martin Lawrence and also good coincidence that we have uh, Klasse Thomas, so the uh, ABK Stuttgart with the class of Patrick Thomas that he, uh, I don't see him now, but he's around. Oh, okay, you're here. I thought you were somewhere else. Uh, but today, since for the work and the, uh, and the complicity they have, I would let you, I would let Tim Rodenbrooker to introduce our speaker. But welcome, Martin Lawrence. <laughs> Hola, ¿qué tal? Yo hablo un poco de español. Uh, yeah, it's a great honor to be here and uh, to introduce my friend Martin. Um, actually, Martin is the reason why I'm here in Barcelona. I live here now since six weeks or something. So also, he's the reason why I teach you in Elisava, so thank you. I know Martin since, um, well, I think 2005 or something, when I was working in a design agency of my father back then. I dreamt of studying graphic design one day and I had these beautiful books that Martin designed and the, the uh, vinyl covers uh, and that stuff that they made. Then they found in Two Points uh, went to Barcelona, and actually he was one of my design heroes. So uh, it's really, really cool. One day we became friends. I think we came in touch about around 2012 because you requested me for this uh, document by Kapitsky yeah. for your right. doctoral yeah. thesis, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah, I don't know. I'm really hyped and actually a little bit surprised that I'm here now introducing this guy and sing, standing in front of you here. So um, yeah, super cool that we do this today and uh, I think the stage is yours. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Tim. Uh, made me feel a bit old that I'm inspiring new generations. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, I'm doing this for quite a while. And um, in 2005, I moved to Barcelona. And then I stayed here for 10 years. Um, but I always went forth and back. And right now, I'm here as well teaching uh, at Elisawa in the bachelor and then in November in the master degree. And yeah, I love doing this. I love teaching. I do this since 2003. And it's uh, very enjoyable. Um, I am going to talk today about flexible system design. And um, I have a question mark there, an exclamation mark, if it's a 21st century skill. And you will judge for yourself at the end of the lecture. Um, I must admit that my way of thinking about systems changed quite a lot, uh, not just since uh, 2005, but especially in the recent years and also professionally a lot changed in my life as well. Um, but I'm going to show you a little bit as well first about where I started. Um, I don't go back that much as Tim did because he was talking about an agency where I was working before founding twopoints.net. So I'm just starting directly with uh, with twopoints.net, which um, sometimes sounds like an agency if you just read about it, or but it's actually just very few people. It's um, Elio down there or here. He's also here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then Lupi and me, we are now since 2015. We are in Hamburg. Um, so we are a very small studio actually. We don't work much with freelancers. But we do all of this stuff. Uh, we do systems for visual identities, like these ones, for example. We do systems for editorial design. And we do systems for type design, display types, uh, 
And this is how we use systems in our studio. So um, systems make us very efficient, but there are more things that I learned about systems in uh, the time that I've spent with the systems, uh, not just teaching them and um, using them or applying them, but also studying them. I did a PhD, a, um, a doctoral thesis at the University of Barcelona about it. And uh, to save you some time, I'm going to talk about the seven most important things that I think that you should know about systems. So the first one is systems make us efficient um, for a basic reason. Something that you could do manually, you can also automate. Um, this is also where Tim and me, we are working on um, coding systems is something that we want to push more in the future. And if you have a system, if you have rules, then you can also automize them. Um, the part that is not that interesting to do. And coding also was really helpful for this project uh, designed for social innovation. Um, I, I don't know if you have attended the lecture of Mariana, but Mariana, the um, head author of this book, has been here giving a lecture um, at Elisava as well. Um, this is um, actually the second book that we did already together in a compiled uh, project case studies uh, of uh, from all over the world um, that show design for social innovation. And this is a pretty thick book with a lot of pages and a lot of cases. And we just got many, like over 100 tables with information, with data. And we had to dis design this book and do an identity for it. And it would have been impossible to do this by hand. We needed the systems and we needed to automate them um, to be able to do this. So what we did as a system, so every typology um, of data got its own visual language. Uh, you can see it over there, the scale of funding, the, scale, the source of funding, the mediums of change, and the team size and composition. Uh, where it was as well too important to visualize how many designers were part of this project to show as well how designers can help in projects for social innovation design. And we converted these then into, uh, we actually did this with uh, processing. Um, and then we converted this into code that could translate automatically then all the tables that we had into uh, hundreds of these diagrams. Um, yeah, so this saved us a lot of time because we did not have to uh, do this manual and update all these hundreds of diagrams that we had to do. And then you get all the, of these kind of, um, of flowers, which at the end were the identity of, um, of the book. So just by like having these overviews or this table of contents in the divider pages, you already got an idea of how much funding they had, how many designers were involved. Um, and when you were opening, when you were in the, one of the articles, one of the case studies, then you could see the entire table as well where you had the specific information, the specific data about the project. Second, um, systems make us flexible. So this is something that we were talking since we started as a design studio about um, that. And sometimes this brings us as well in trouble. If a client comes, most of the times when they ask for a visual identity, they want us to make a logo for them. And we always tell them we don't do logos, we do systems. And the logo is one of the things that is going to be generated from the system. But we can't start with the logo because it's just the most simple version of the of the system. And if you start with a system, then you have some core components um, that in their combination or their rules, how they work together with each other, they can generate different kinds of applications. And one of them can be the logo. Meanwhile, ev if everything is based on that logo and then the logo has to change, uh, most of the times this means a completely redesign of the complete identity because everything is based on this one symbol. 
And this is what it basically is. It is a symbol. I mean, it's, it's, it, it represents something. It repent, represents ownership or it represents an idea or it represents um, a message. But it's not that um, versatile or eloquent as a language. So I compare systems to languages um, because they, in their combination, they are able to uh, change their messages according to the context, the person that you're talking to, the kind of function it has, to whom you want to talk. So you're much more flexible in the way, in the message that you generate. Um, the example that I want to show you uh, is a, um, well, it's a, it's a little bit, it's an older project. Um, and actually it has been redesigned. So I don't know if this is a failure or uh, from us, or from them, I don't know, uh, open to discussion who made the mistake. But uh, actually, um, it is not, um, what I'm going to show you is they're not going to, they're not using it as we, uh, as we, yeah, as we wanted them to use it. So this is the study that we did before we started proposing new logos for them or new symbols for them. This, the ADI is um, the organization of industrial designers. Uh, here in Barcelona, and they started in '61 uh, with a logo that André Ricard designed. Um, this is the organization, the logo for the organization. Then they had the main award, which was Delta, and this symbol is also based on the Delta. Actually, it's a mix in between the lowercase and the uppercase Delta sign. Um, and then they have the Medalla, which came in the 1976. Uh, as well, which is closer to a circle. So all of it had its history and it ended up um, becoming a triangle and the medallas uh, becoming a um, uh, hexagon. And we had to invent another symbol for a new award. And we thought, okay, this is, has three edges, six edges. So we're going to do, we double this again and we do uh, 12. Uh, so the new sign then got 12 and you can see it on the bottom there. Okay, so but this until now, this is not what we mean by systems. This is just another symbol. This is not flexible. This is not what is um, giving us much possibilities. So what we did is we converted this into a typeface and we based ourselves on the first version of the Futura uh, by Paul Renner because um, actually, I don't know if you know this, but the um, Bauer types, um, the Hartmann family uh, who lives in here in Barcelona, um, they commercialized the Futura pretty early on before it was in Frankfurt, but then they moved to Barcelona as well. So, I mean, everybody says always the Futura is a very German typeface, but actually, if you look at the history of the printed stuff from the six, then you see a lot of Futura here. So, I mean, who's to say that it's a German typeface if it's used so much here? So maybe it's more a Spanish typeface now, no? Just because it has its, had its origins there. Who knows? So this is really what identified to us as well the, the base, the origin of the Adifat. And uh, then we used this to design the uh, Futuro, not the Futura. Um, where we took all the round shapes and we substituted them by the symbols. So when you um, do this, then you can create for each of the three awards, you can create their own unique sub identity. Um, so the Delta has then the triangle um, and then you can change as well over the years, you can change the different colors, but the Actually, the writing tool, just writing, um, is becoming the identity. And until today, we are uh, working a lot with um, typography um, <coughs> to create visual identities because typography itself is a, is a flexible system. Um, and if it is special enough that you recognize its character, then it also helps you to make an institution recognizable, identifiable. So the typeface is the identity. OK, 
Okay, third, uh, systems make us better. Um, I'm not talking just about formal solutions anymore here. I'm talking as well about how you organize your design studio and uh, your life and how you want to work. And um, pretty early on, we understood <coughs> that if you just work on your own, this can be pretty tiring and also you can try to learn everything, um, but you will always have your own perspective. And it's much more interesting if you have some people that push you as well into different directions, things that you didn't really uh, anticipate it and uh, get completely new perspectives, even on your own work. So just being with other people and learning about their different perspectives is, um, yeah, is such an um, advantage. Um, and this is a recent project. This is something that we just finished um, this last, uh, well, recent, last winter. <laughs> Um, so it's um, Spain has been the guest of honor at the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is a pretty pretty big deal, because you get like two thousand square meters at the Frankfurt Book Fair, and um, they invite all the important Spanish authors, and they're touring usually to Germany, and it's quite important for them as well for the distribution of their work, and we thought that. I mean, first of all, what was a bit of an innovation for them is not to use the, the, the red and the yellow for Spain to represent Spain. Um, but we thought it's very important because it is not just about Spanish culture or Spain as a geographical you know, uh, place, but it's about everything that is uh, Spanish and everyone, everything that got influenced by Spanish and Spanish got influenced by them. And that doesn't, so the idea of, of, this, of this identity was that, um, that you can't really stop uh, creativity and that it never keeps within its geographic boundaries that they're invented by states, but that creativity always spreads. And this actually was also spreading creativity before Corona came was the idea for the slogan and then we said, no, we can't do this. In Spanish, it works much better. Creatividad desbordante, like going over the borders. <laughs> in English, in German, it was much more difficult to translate this. So yeah, that's the idea for the, um, for the identity. And uh, the way how we did it is, I mean, you see here some texture. And this is something that I wouldn't have done. I'm pretty lazy. I, I stick to my laptop and I, uh, just work on my laptop uh, and I do stuff in Cinema 4D. So this is Cinema 4D and, and whatever program you can imagine. But I'm too lazy to get out my paint and do stuff. So um, this is where Lupi's idea came in then to do these kind of textures by hand. So she did over a hundred of different kinds of acrylic textures and invented new techniques how to create these, uh, these textures. And then we were blowing up them up with uh, with AI to do discussions, but they well we use them everywhere. So at the end, it was a combination of um, different types of forms or animations, and then these uh, acrylic patterns. So I did like different kinds of gestures. They also have a random um, algorithm in it, so they are all the time different. Um, but we just have to pop a different texture on top of this 3D animation. <coughs> And then we got a new image. And just the system, the simple system, made it much easier as well to create lots and lots of different kinds of animations and images. Um, so you had this one that was like um, stones floating through space. Then they had the one that is the, the meter balls. And then you had the one that is um, fabric. And with these three get gestures, actually, we had enough to create like lots of different stuff. Yeah, so it's even the carpets. So it's like really everywhere. I mean, I, I didn't check the toilets, but it's probably also there. <laughs> Uh, that's the, you know them probably, this um, 
Well, this is uh, our president, Tim's and mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Very good book, Papyrus. Yeah, and then we also did the catalog. Uh, this is something that Tim briefly mentioned. Um, I can't show you in this lecture everything that we did, but we actually started out as book designers. So we did, you can check out the website. I'm not going to uh, bore you with it. But we are basically, we're coming from editorial design actually. And, and this is also, uh, I mean, after all this time, like working design actually, we are really in favor as well of the process of editorial design because your aim is to inform people to make reading easy and sometimes in visual identities or in, in branding, your objective is uh, maybe to convince someone by something that this person didn't even want. And this is, you don't do this in editorial design. So we are still huge fans of editorial design and love making books, even though it's becoming much, much harder to do nice books and get the budgets for it. Okay, um, four. Uh, systems are contextual. Um, when I was studying graphic design, I always thought, okay, this is the way how communication design works. I design something and I have a target audience and then it goes from A to B and done. So this is how it works. Um, but I recognize that it's not at all how it works and that this is all in my head just, that what I want to do is never what is happening at the end. So when the people have my design, they look at it and they think something completely different or they do something completely different with it. So when you're designing, you have to design something, an object or an image or whatever it is, thinking in the context in which it is going to be looked at and how it's going to be understood. So if you don't take this into con uh, consideration, um, then it's even more unlikely that communication is going to happen. This, uh, that communication is unlikely, this is from a German sociologue called uh, Niklas Luhmann, but communication is pretty hard. Um, so it's, if you design something that is thought about working well in a, in a specific context, then you have higher chances that it will actually work. So the example for this project is Helsinki Design Lab. This is a, um, a strategic design um, organization that doesn't exist anymore, um, but it was very important for lots of social innovation design institutions or not-for-profits coming later. Um, I'm actually working now for one, for one not-for-profit, Dark Matter Labs, which got inspired as well in, um, in Helsinki Design Lab. And... Um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a sort of design that helps as well to uh, change bureaucracy because uh, bureaucracy and all these bureaucratic systems are actually preventing real change. Um, so they, are, they like to say that before was the uh, system thinking and what we want to do is system doing. So we want to change really something. We don't want to think about solutions. We want to implement solutions. So they're focusing on the implementation part. So in this project, we also uh, focused on the implementation part. So one of the, I'm going quickly here, but one of my favorite images is this image actually. It is not shiny at all. It doesn't look good. And uh, you will find thousands of websites which have nicer images. But I like this image that much because it means that someone really used what we did there. Um, so everything that they did was made to be used. And they were taking into account, and sometimes I think as well we forget this when we design just digitally. I mean, in my world, everything has become digitally. I don't print, I mean, really few things. Um, but there are a lot of advantages. So a book like this, can be a complete Trojan horse because you're walking around with that book. You show that you identify with this idea. You have it at home. Maybe you don't read it, but you have it in your shelf and you are looking at it every now and then. And then you take it and you look at it again and you read something and then you put it away. Um, so you can't really do this with digital stuff. The moment that you close your computer because you're annoyed by whatever, it's gone. Um, 
So nicely or well designed books that are functional as well, that help the people as well. This is like um, what we call now pre-reads. It's like what we do before gatherings. We compile information that are necessary to have a conversational framework um, to discuss um, certain subjects. Um, so everybody's up to speed with the uh, subjects that we want to talk about. Yeah, so we did a lot of, we did the identity for it and we did a lot of publications. And you see that um, this is the Trojan horse, actually it's one of the ideas of strategic design that you do something. So, I mean, actually sometimes people say like doing something beautiful or nice or that is decoration, that is not that important. But actually doing something nice also means that people are more likely to keep it or being attracted by it. So they had this idea, this idea wasn't ours, but Dan Hill, who wrote this brilliant book, um, Trojan Horses and Dark Matter, um, he had this metaphor as well of the dark horse, and he said, yeah, why don't you let Two Points design posters? And then he was right all along that everybody wanted to have posters then, and they took them all home then after this gathering. And now, uh, 10 years later, you see that this idea really uh, spread. In the last 10 years, a lot happened in social innovation design. Five, uh, systems show accountability. Um, again, this is something that I had to learn. Um, when I started as a graphic designer, I um, said, okay, I'm not responsible for anything that my client does or uh, because I'm just like the, the one in the middle that translates. And I'm there to help my client, but I'm actually not really co-author. And the moment that you see the world more like a system, you recognize that anything that you do uh, can have a consequence, a bad one and a good one. So this is, goes always both ways. Um, so this changed my, my way as well of judging if I want to do a work or not. Um, always considering as well if I can afford not to do this work. I'm not judgmental about anyone who has to do a certain work, work to pay the rent. Um, but it's definitely something that I had to think about a lot. So here I don't have any example at all because it's all the projects that we decided not to do. Six, systems can't be controlled. Um, when you hear systems, you think about grids. You think about people that want to control the world, put it into a matrix and then control every aspect and how it's going to work out, you know? But it's actually, if you really learn about systems, you recognize that nothing can be really planned, that everything emerges because the world is too complex to really be able to plan. Um, of course, you can make plans, you can make a setup for everything, you can start you can, you can try, uh, try to control everything like this animation all started at the same time with the same finger at the same uh, with the same machine but you see that at the end it has to be the tiniest things in this circumstances it changes totally the outcome so it's better to have a flexible system which allows you also to react to the different phases in which the project exists. So I'm also not a huge fan of just designing something and then shooting it in space. I think it works much better if you can be there and you can be as well um, helping your client over a long time. So um, this would work actually much uh, better. Um, and Flexible visual system in itself is actually for me a project that very much as well uh, expresses this. So when I s finished studying, I studied the, first I studied in Germany and then I studied uh, at the KBK in The Hague. Um, and I got inspired by this system thinking through Peter van Blockland, who's w who was very much into coding and so when he's doing now editorial, editorial design courses, he doesn't work with InDesign. He lets the students code their books. And I like very much the idea of thinking about design as well in that way because you, like, you 
can really omit all the lock-in effects and the dependencies to certain tools and create your own tools. Um, at that moment, um, I hated it. I mean, I, I didn't like Petta. I thought that these ideas are stupid and I thought that it's like, it's too rigid. I wanted to do like art or crazy stuff or paint. So it was really something that I didn't appreciate. And then years later, I was thinking, shit, he was right all along. And it took me a very long time to understand this. Um, so, and then I had this phase, like four years where I worked for the Horde, what uh, uh, Tim also mentioned before. And I was, um, they were doing record sleeves and I was doing record sleeves then too for them. But I was like the responsible one for visual identity. So I was trying to apply what I learned in the Hague uh, with systems. But it was very, I mean, it was very intuitive, everything what I did there. So, and I came to, in 2005, to Barcelona to um, work uh, on my PhD. It took me a very long time, as you can see, to do this. Um, so I was studying um, a lot of people from the 70s, from the 60s, but also the 90s, I was doing um, bibliographical research, but also case studies. And I was trying to find out what they all have in common. So maybe they use different kinds of terms, but actually they're speaking about the same thing. So I was trying to compare terms and systems, how they were talking about. And I was developing my own model, but of course, of course something has changed in between the 70s and now. Now we have interaction design, we have motion design and we have and designers are coding so a lot of things have changed so i developed a new model and i spent so much time on it and it was so hard work and i wanted to i, I wanted to stop doing the phd like three years before finishing i was saying no this uh, i can't do it anymore it's uh, i just leave it there and pff, i don't give a shit this is done and then i well and then i at the end i was then able to finish it and but it was very frustrating in a way as well because I recognized that not too many people read it because, um, I mean, some people read it very <laughs> in detail, but uh, a lot of people also don't care about uh, like uh, 600, 700 pages of tables and in an A4 uh, with small images. It's very unattractive to read. So then, there, I got to a next phase and I thought that, okay, I have to do something but which is but much more pragmatic, which uh, people also just like to browse through and don't have to read from beginning until end, but just pick something and do something with it and then leave it again. So I was starting to do a book and I thought, ah, oh, this is also again one of your projects. They're going to take 10 years and nobody's going to appreciate all the work that you put in. And then I uh, was talking to publishers and the publisher was saying, yeah, it's a nice idea, but you should do it completely different. And then I remember Tim was telling me, ah, fuck them, they have no idea. <laughs> so I went to someone else and I made a Kickstarter and uh, got all the funding to do this book. And then they published it and I received so much uh, support by, I mean, fellow designers that helped me to spread the word, but also um, like people that bought the book and this blew my mind because I was sitting in my room and thinking about these things and I thought this is such a nonsense thing what you're doing there. Um, so this wasn't planned, this just emerged. And um, this is how I go about this, uh, this project as well now. So it's every time new things emerge and new things are happening, um, like for example, in um, 2000 and at the end of the last year, I started uh, to do, to convert this book into online courses. Um, ah, yeah, the English edition is already in the fifth edition, which is quite incredible. Um, and now I'm working on, on this thing and I started really small. I mean, it was like, um, yeah, just a couple of people following me there on Patreon and doing these courses. And slowly but slowly, they're getting more and more. And it's an interesting platform because 
Uh, I'm also developing new thoughts based on old thoughts uh, from the book. And um, together with them as well, I'm developing this, this curriculum. And it's, it's a thing that is much more alive and is, um, it's growing and growing. And then another thing uh, actually happened or happen will happen uh, is that um, some, I don't know, you never know how this kind of things happens, but a design studio in uh, the UK, they saw this book in a bookstore and they thought, ah, oh, it's interesting for us. It looks a bit like a bit stuff like that could be interesting for us. It's a, like a design studio that does also coding. And they said, okay, we're going to take this page. They just took one page out of this book and said, okay, we're going to create a tool with it, a generative tool. And they're developing it further and further. This is just one of the versions. There are a lot of bugs in it still. Like, but they're, um, like if you look at it next week, it's going to be already much cleaner and you have much more options as well to do, to position the typography. But they did this completely without telling me anything about it and just did it on their own because they were interested in it. And I would never have guessed that this would happen. They just really liked it and they just wanted to explore this, um, this idea. Um, and yeah, and what's, what's happening right now, so now I'm getting support by the famous uh, Spanish high society. <laughs> uh, no, this, it's, yeah, um, someone might not know, but this is a fake mock-up. Uh, <laughs> No, the book isn't printed yet. It's printing at the moment right now, but it's going to be probably printed already um, by, by next year. And uh, Grafica is uh, distributing it. And um, yeah, so this is also pretty exciting for me because even though I'm German and my, I, have a, I have a huge dialect when I talk Spanish, but um, I feel very at home here because my kids, they're Spanish and I spent here 10 years of my life and um, I probably have more people that I know here in Spain than, or in Barcelona than in Germany. So this is a huge deal that it's coming out now in Spanish. Okay, the seventh um, thing that I learned. Um, and this is, now we're going full circle back to the beginning and it's actually the end. Um, so in the beginning I was saying systems make us efficient and that's true but efficiency and this is also something that changed I thought I was that flexible system design the most important aspect of it is it makes everyone more efficient but now I don't think about this the same way anymore um, because of course efficiency um, if we think uh, not just about our studio or about our friends or cities, but we think about in planetary terms and we think about costs and consequences of design, then efficiency can be something great um, through technical in innovations. It can uh, helps us to save uh, energy and, uh, and material. But then there's also another thing that happens with efficiency uh, which is called the Jevons Paradox. I don't know if you heard about it, but it's, uh, it's from a guy, uh, a three year from a guy uh, who's called Jevons. And uh, a very long time ago, in the Industrial uh, Revolution, he was researching efficiency uh, of the use of coal. And all the steam engines, they were using a lot of coal. So um, they weren't thinking probably that much about the uh, climate crisis but they were thinking about uh, efficiency, so it was very expensive. So another guy invented a, a steam engine that saved a lot of energy and a lot of money, and they thought, ah, oh, great, now we're going to have much more coal, everything is going to be much, more, much cheaper and probably less uh, air pollution. But what happened was the contrary. Because it was cheaper, more and more steam engines were built and they used them for more and more uh, things. So at the end, they ended up with a complete contrary uh, thing. They, instead of being more efficient, they were less efficient. And this is, um, yeah, well, this is what, what happens in the, the kind of systems that we have. 
uh, right now. So when I talk now about efficiency, I always have this in mind. No? It's great for in certain cases, but it can be really bad in planetary scales. Um, so I don't know, probably you have seen this as well, is that how we surpass the planetary boundaries um, and that we are now uh, surpassed six uh, and uh, 2015 it was just uh, four. Um, so flexible system design 21st century skill, I think depending on how you define this, but I think it has to be. I think you have to see, think about your work in a systemic way in the bigger systems in which you actually have an impact on. And uh, to me, it is very helpful as well to think in this donut model. This is what you have seen before as well. It's called the donut uh, model. But to think in, um, yeah, in design or what we should do, what you shouldn't do in these terms. Um, it's, it's not too good to do, well, to have to less. Um, and you can apply this to your own economic situation, but also to the economic situation of countries or continents. Um, it is what we, it's also not good to have too much because then we're going to spend too much and we can't spend more without taking it from somewhere. So what we tr what should try to achieve is enough. What means enough, it's a big question. And how we are going to achieve this is an even bigger question. And I'm not able to answer that question. I think it's the question of the 21st century that we all have to think about. So what Kate Walworth, who invented the donut model says, is that it's boundaries that unleash our potential. So you might know this as well, that the more restrictions you have, the more creative you get. And if we see this as well as a creative challenge, is how we can do design in a more sustainable way, that I'm sure we can come up with creative solutions for doing that. And it's basically the system thinking that we need to try to achieve. So instead of just thinking about an economy of extraction, so just taking it because it's everything for free, it doesn't matter that it took millions of years to appear, we have to come to an understanding of the world that is in flows. So even ourselves, we are in flows. We are the stuff that we sit on, that we use. Everything is in a flow. And everything that we do will end up somewhere else. Um, so it's, you have to look at the before and the after as well in your in design. So what can I do? I don't think we, I can do much or you can do much. I think we have to do it together. Um, this is also something I learned that I showed you before already, that the only way of solving this is uh, forming communities with people with different expertises. We as designers, we might come up with a cool poster or a cool postcard or a cool exhibition and a great message on social media, but is this really helpful? So it's much more effective if we get friends with, uh, with lawyers, with people from economy. No, we need to build this bigger networks because we can't know everything. This is, um, this is something also that I learned in a hard way as well since beginning of the year working for the not-for-profit. I'm in every meeting the most stupid person in the room. And it's actually a great feeling because it means that I can still learn a lot even that I'm that old as Tim says. But it's, uh, there's always new things to learn. And it's actually, it's great as well to have, be in this situation again, to be like a student again, to learn new things. Um, so what I, what I learned is that it's very important in all of this is because it's a really tough question and it's depressing and frustrating that you need to be hard on the systems but always soft on the people. And we are all changing, we all have different opinions and we might contradict our uh, in, in opinions, but maybe not that much. Maybe it's just a question of, term, of language, how we communicate with each other. So that's the um, very last slide. Thank you very much for um, listening. Um,
arrived on time for the questions. But so who has a question for Martin? Come on. Hi, Martin. How are you? Hey, good. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, <laughs> thanks for sharing, always. Uh, one thing I, I want to tell you, not ask you, it's uh, I'm very, very grateful that you always uh, want to share all of your knowledge, you know? So thank you. I love your book. And uh, I'm wondering if you are working in another one now or you are thinking on work uh, in another one or... Yeah, I'm thinking about several books actually uh, at the same time. I mean, uh, I this not-for-profit that I'm working for is a pretty big one. It's over 100, uh, it's 100 people uh, there in Korea and Canada and Netherlands and Germany, UK. So they're everywhere and I'm like the lead designer and it's a really scary thing to do because it's, there are so many people that are so smart and I have to go there and tell them, no, you do it wrong. You have to design it like this. You have to work like this. So what I'm interested in is as well, like putting this experience that I'm making right now um, of implementing design uh, in bigger institutions. Um, so this is something that one day, but who knows, maybe 10 years. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> this is something hope I'm working. Huh? I hope less. <laughs> Uh, this is something that I'm really interested in. And then also what uh, is also really, but it's still like it's thoughts in my head, you know, but I'm, I'm thinking about as well how much we were influenced by uh, commercial design in the last century and how much of the communication is one directional. So trying to convince a consumer to buy something and, and, and how much of it can we use to have a more conversational design so we can really are we can be more honest about um, transporting information and create a, a framework for conversations and I don't say I don't think that we should break with everything that we have done I think we, there's a, we achieved so much good stuff uh, that it's more about like reflecting on what happened in the last hundred years and seeing what we can use nowadays to build maybe a real social network and maybe we don't need it to be digital maybe it's cool to do it with people no so this is the the two things i think that i'm right now mostly interested in and yeah let's see hopefully it's less than 10 years <laughs> cool thank you thank you Hi. Uh, in your book, Inflexible Visual System, there is a part uh, that you speak about um, that a system could be just a way of treating photos. Uh, I was wondering, like, since I read it, I was like all the time thinking about it. How could I implement this, like, to make the visual identity as simple as a system of treating photos? How could you expand on it? Could you? Yeah, I didn't really talk much about the book. That's true, and my model. So. Uh, what I discovered is that what we have done a lot in our design history is we worked with shapes and we found ways how to work with these shapes. So this is the, the, the kind of the system, the type of system that I call form-based systems. But then I discovered that there's another one uh, which I call the transformation-based systems and they are more process-oriented. So it's about the identification happens through the way how you transform something could be type could be image or photography like you mentioned but just by transforming something always in the same way you can create um, a, a recognizable identity so i always explain this like uh, creating a filter like uh, using spark ar or using processing to transform images or at the end, the kind of the way that you find to transform these images 
will be the one that um, the entity that you're working for will be recognized for. And this could be anything. It could be also you going to a photocopy machine and there are certain ways how you photocopy or how you move the sheets or it could be some sort of printing technique that is very special that you use. If you just find like um, a rule book, and that's important. It's not the kind of uh, system design that we know from digital design based on assets. It's more process oriented type of system. So instead of uh, designing or defining like different objects and shapes and assets, you have to define more like a recipe for cooking. So first you take this and then you do this with it and then you do this with it. So you have to describe, you have to find a system, a rule book for transforming things. And do you think that uh, there could be like a company or a brand that uh, only does this? Like the, the other parts of the identity, they don't have a system. So there's always like a different typography, different whatever. But the way that they treat their images is always the same. And could it be recognizable and could it work in the real world? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are lots of examples, not as many examples as for the form-based systems. But uh, even in my PhD, I already had a couple. Um, and I think they are much more now because much more people work with uh, motion design and work with coding. Um, but even back then, when I was doing my, uh, my PhD, there was um, a theater in London um, and the design agency called Self Service, I think. Does it ring a bell? Self Service? Yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's, ah, I'm old. It's, it's, but they were famous back then. Uh, so they were doing uh, actually a very smart thing for their posters for the for the theater. So they, for every new play, they took objects like uh, coffee and cigarettes, and they put on their scanner. They put cigarettes. They put um, yeah, they put coffee, just the objects that they thought would represent the play. And then they put a color filter on top of it and they were scanning it. And just by the light, this typical light that the scanner has and this uh, gradation, this, uh, this color gradation, they already had an identity and it was so easy for them to do the posters and it was looking great and very special because everybody want, wanted to do this high gloss professional pictures. And this was very rough and this is just the filter. So the way how they took the photography. So if you find a way, a specific style, photogra uh, a photographic style, then this is already like could be an identity. Oh. Okay, so thanks. Scottish. Scottish? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ah, yeah, it could be, yeah. was so inspired by the conversational design. And for example, when you spoke about Futura and you said maybe it's a Spanish font, um, that it is, that to me has like a conversational mindset where you're having that experience. So my question is when you are going to a client, how do you set an expectation for that conversational tone? How do you get a client to feel that culture and have that conversational experience? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, the first thing we, that we have to explain to them is that we are going to design a system for them and not a logo, because everybody knows what a logo is and they think they all need this logo. Um, and it's true, there's a lot of places where we need this logo, but if you think about it like in social media, it's most of the times just a profile pic or at websites, the home button. So at the moment that you scroll down, it's not that important anymore. So first we have to tell them about the impact actually that it really has on their perception. Because one thing is the identity, which is a proposal by the designer. And the other thing is the image that the company actually has. So it's the perception that this company has. And one thing is what you want, and the other thing is what you actually are in the eyes of the people that you want to communicate with. So, and then, this is the first thing that we tell them that we design a system because like this we can react faster as well to perceptions that are not wanted. Um, so they are becoming more flexible. 
Um, the other thing which is a bit more difficult is to get this time as well to um, assess them or to be with them. And I mean, Mario had a lot of situations in which he was able to have long-term clients and that's the fantastic situation. But we, I mean, we don't really have often this uh, possibility to do so, but it would be actually best to do this. Interbrand is calling it the brand cycle. So they're really trying to be with their clients all the time um, and, and help them as well along the way. And I think the moment that they understand that, um, that it's not that easy, um, that it's not just like I'm sending a message from A to B, and the moment they understand that perception can change as well over time and everything, they already start to think about the identity as something that is not them, but something that is out there, which is good because then they can reflect about it as well, which can mean as well external, internal identification. Do we want to be this? The moment that identity is just yourself and you can't really put it outside of yourself, you can't really reflect about it. And that's the good as well about, um, I think this kind of understanding of uh, and, and what what is conversational design about is as well, that you even are aware of your own designs becoming something completely different the moment that you materialize it. The moment that it's out there, it's not you anymore. It's something that works or it doesn't work or you still might like it, but if it doesn't work, why are you doing it? No? So I think this is a, it's, it's just like a, a slight mind shift that you need to provoke. I'm going to do a picture of you. <laughs> More questions? Más preguntas? Hi. How can we test the assist flexibility of a system? How I test it? Yeah. How can we figure out if our system is flexible enough for yeah. our purpose? Um, yeah, so the easiest test, uh, what I do in, in my classes as well, is that I try to test out the extremes uh, and then hopefully everything that you will do in the future lies in between these extremes. So everything that in between small and big, there's a, like an interpolation in between these two. No? A bit like designing variable fonts, so you have masters, like small, uh, big, um, uh, horizontal, vertical, um, loud, silent, because it's like a person that has to communicate. No, you want to be louder when you're in a public space where there's a lot of noise, and you want to be more silent if you're at home with someone or if you're sending something that has to be no more neutral. So you, you you're trying to define these extremes, and then you already can be pretty sure that the interpolation in between this. Uh, extremes will work out fine. So this is the, the like the basic tests to do. And then also, uh, it sounds stupid, but I also like to put it, uh, the design, to test the design on mockups that are um, also come close to reality because it is very difficult sometimes, especially us just working digitally to imagine how it works in space. like. Before using the computer, when you were doing a poster, you had the poster in front of you and you know how to read it. So from this distance, you read this text. And then from this distance, you read this. So you, you understand how you interact with the design in space and you lose this on the computer. Like a stamp is, has the same size as a huge poster. And it's, it reality doesn't work that way. Um, so. Uh, I'm, I'm doing mock-ups, but if I would do it properly, then I probably would need to print out stuff like you would do for wayfinding systems or, and to see it really in real space. Thank you. More questions? I have a 
have more of a technical question. So a lot of the works that you showed showed a lot of animation. I frankly don't know a lot about animation, but I really admired your work. So I wanted to know your process behind the animations, what kind of softwares you use, what references you use as well, everything about animation, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I, I might have a disappointing uh, answer to that, because um, I, like one of the things that I, when I choose a, a project, then I choose the project based on, okay, this pays my rent, but I also choose the project uh, based on what I can learn from this project. So often I go into projects not knowing enough for doing this project. So um, like what you have seen, what we did for the Spain uh, guest of honor thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I didn't know more than this at that moment. So that's why it ended up to be like this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where I got it from. I just saw, oh, there's a metaball function. Oh, you can do this. So, okay, three is enough. I don't need to learn more. So it was basically just this. And what can I do? to make it look different than the stuff that I have seen. So this is, of course, this is important to me. But um, I like very much as well this uh, learning by doing and testing it if it works or not. And, um, and often, yeah, and you will see, I mean, that the every, with every project I get, uh, I know more about these tools and I know about animation. I'm doing it now pretty different. I mean, what you have seen there in this uh, Guest of Honor, it's a very slow animation because also I didn't know much about rhythm in, in motion design because I come from static design, from print design. And so uh, this was really tough for me to learn as well about having a nice, interesting rhythm in animation. So the latest <laughs> projects, they have much more of this proper timing, what makes it more interesting to look at. Um, yeah. So there, it's always the result of what I know until that moment. And has it always been the same software that you use for the animation? No, 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 no. Uh, it's, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's every time it's uh, something new. I mean, it's, um, I, I gave up, like, I think also, like, my big advice for everyone would be uh, don't spend too much just on learning a program. Uh, focus on communication, focus on people and what works for people and everything else is technical and comes later. And, um, and when you have an idea, you will find somewhere a YouTube tutorial to teach you this. You know, it's not a technical stuff is not the big thing and programs change every five years. So uh, don't invest too much time in learning programs. Thank you. This is more like an existential question. <laughs> <laughs> How do you deal with the tough clients? I mean, the client that doesn't fully understand design and doesn't give the importance of it, if you ever have to deal with it. I don't know. Yeah, of course. Um, well, one, um, I mean, to be fair, the main reason for uh, founding my own studio was because I wanted to say no to clients and whether when I was an employee I had to deal with these clients because uh, I couldn't just fire them <laughs> without firing myself um, but I think there should be a trust in your expertise and um, if there's no trust as well then it's hard to work with this person um, especially designer or clients that are like overstepping, uh, so they become art directors. Um, they know much more about their target audience and about their product and about their competitors than you, but they don't, they, I mean, they don't know anything about design or communication, otherwise they wouldn't have commissioned you to do it. And this has to be cl clear from the beginning, that there are clearly defined roles, who's doing what. And I think what was also helpful for me as well always is that to say that I'm not defending here my baby, but it's we both have a task to do something for a third person that is not even in the room. 
So we don't have to satisfy you or me. So the, you are, in this moment, your customer is our client. We are working together. We are like a team, or we should be. And then if you see it doesn't work because I don't know what, you have to fire the client. I mean, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's not good for them and not good for yourself. Yeah, because it's really hard to sell the, the idea, you know, with someone that who doesn't understand really well. So re it's really yeah. tough. I mean, you have to, have to keep your, you have to listen, of course, because they know things that you don't know. But um, there are also things that they don't know. And this is where they shouldn't get involved. Thank you. More questions? I basically just want to thank you, Martin. I've followed your work for many years. I've always been a big um, fan of what you're doing. Um, because it's a young audience, and as Mark mentioned, um, I'm, in, I'm in Barcelona with um, a group of, I think, 30 quite young, up-and-coming uh, visual communicators. I've already a few of them have been talking about AI, the impact of AI. And uh, I know it's a very, very predictable uh, question at this stage, but I, you, you talked briefly about delegating the boring stuff in processes to, to, to AI or, or systems, whether they're coding. Um, how much, you, in the future, how, well, hang on, <laughs> I don't know how to kind of uh, uh, get, uh, deliver this one. Um, how concerned are you about um, how AI is gonna impact on, on the field of visual communication? I mean, I'm reading uh, Mustafa Suleiman's The Coming Wave. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else is in the room uh, is reading it and it's causing me lots of sleepless, sleepless nights. Um, I'm just curious to hear a little bit, I know it's a massive subject, but I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about your take on AI and, the, and how yeah, it's gonna impact yeah. young people's lives yeah. primarily. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, in, in, you know Page, right? I just published their four pages article uh, uh, about AI and how we should be very careful with it. And this is a very soft version of an 11 pages article that I wrote about it, which is much more, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the page editor, she helped me to make it more sympathetic and, <laughs> and more hopeful. And I, I, I'm, pretty, um, I'm pretty worried about it uh, f for a lot of reasons. Um, I can't recite the 11 pages, but I, I think that we tend to, first of all, I think that we, the problem of us humans is that we tr tend to think in within our own system boundaries. So this might be ourselves, the individuals or our family or our city or our country or our continent, but we are never really able and probably also we don't want to consider a planetary boundary because it's overwhelming, it's complex, and it doesn't allow you to keep on having the same lifestyles that we have right now. So um, right now we are witnessing that, um, the plan that a lot of overshoot in the planetary boundaries and that the things don't go as they should go. And we're trying to look for ways of keeping the economy up and um, being more and more efficient and I think this, this search for efficiency is and trying to keep the status quo and not trying to think beyond the dynamics that we live in right now is actually dangerous. And one thing is the system boundaries and the other thing is that we always try to find shortcuts. And I think in several fields of human learning and acting and um, uh, we need time for, for learning and uh, we, we can't use shortcuts. So I think a certain things as well, I mean, when studying, when reading, when writing, I think that when we become too lazy to do the, all, these, all of these hard things ourselves and we use help from AI, we don't pay attention to the details anymore. No? And as Im say, the details make the design. 
So I'm, I'm very much worried about, um, about this. And then, of course, as well, the flood of information, fake information that we're going to get. It looks all very great, but it's, if you really look at it, it's all bullshit. And we have so much bullshit already in, on the internet. Um, so it will be really hard to find out what's really worth to spend your life with. You will be always, we already bombarded on Twitter, like you're missing out if you don't know this new AI tool, you're going to stay behind, you're not going to be competitive anymore. And this kind of fear mongering situation, I really don't like right now. So I actually, uh, I, I, I more and more, I'm, I'm trying to focus on simple solutions. So I think flexible, it's more likely that flexible visual systems will go to the pencil than to AI. Because I, I also, we're just throwing into the garbage all the great stuff that has been happening already in, this, uh, in the history of uh, humanity, just by having a new tool to play with. And um, uh, Harari actually calls it spiritual slavery because um, the AI understands us very well, but we don't understand a fuck what it's doing. And that's a, that's a tricky situation. If we don't even know what our tools are doing anymore, then we're not able to change our tools. And then there comes the moment that we depend on it because we don't know how to do stuff anymore. So, so I mean, how to fix our kitchen or, you know? So I'm, I'm, um, I, I think that there's great opportunities in AI, in AI because of these system boundaries that we are not able as humans to look much, I mean, behind our boundaries. So maybe if we use it right, AI could be a tool to understand or to get a different perspective on the world. So this is my great hope. But a profit-oriented company won't do this. So I don't know. At the end, I, I, I need a page editor to make me sound a bit more optimistic. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, maybe it's a connecting question. I just want to g have your opinion if you think, like uh, we as like visual designers have like an impact on such things as climate crisis, or what is it if if we are like caught in the system um, we live in, or if we have yeah, an impact. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. Um, of course, we are all caught in the system. That's why I said that we have to be hard on the system, but soft on the people. That we just do what we are able to do and we can all try to do our bit. Um, what I think is, what is important to understand is that, uh, that we alone as visual designers, we cannot do much. I mean, that we need uh, to be working together with people in so-called leverage points where we can really change something and then we can use our skills like visualization skills to show different perspectives on things, um, but also making certain things more attractive, more readable. Um, we can create these conversational frameworks, we can transmit information. Um, so all of these things are very helpful if they have the right purpose and the right function. But I, I really think that it's very important and one of the main tasks also has, has to be to find these people you know, and, and to form these groups. And, um, and it's very difficult because we are all like in our own bubbles and um, we learned, we, we, we don't have a generalist uh, approach. Uh, we, we are mostly focused in our disciplines and categories and it's hard to break out of this. I mean, this is, this is uh, centuries of ways of organizing the learning experience as well that brought us to this situation. And, uh, but we have to try just to, um, to, find, to find people to talk to that we trust and then we trust the expertise because we need different kinds of expertise because the, 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 these problems, they don't, they don't exist since yesterday. No? So all of these things also that we are 
this is happening since very long. Uh, if you read the Club of Rome, they were already predicting all of this, what's happening, no? But it's, um, um, yeah, but it's, it's, you need to find structures as well, communities of practice that are able to change something and not just uh, form a critique and then, or warn people and then hope that someone hopefully uh, somewhere does something. So yeah, I think that's, that could be a role for us. Hello. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I really like your intervention on accountability and creating, creating system with accountability and then what you just said about creating systems um, that work and then it seems like we all as designer create systems and then as we go we are so proud of our work that we create our own system and then we don't take into account that someone has already done a system of some sort and then what you just said now about um, what we're doing and then how make the work sustainable, for example. Um, I moved to Barcelona six weeks ago and then so I'm very new to the city and then I am a designer but then on the side I look at recycling symbols and then I was looking at something like I, was, I wanted to recycle and in Spanish it says put it in the yellow I was like, but it doesn't make sense. Someone needs to be accountable for this because put it in the yellow doesn't mean anything for everyone, like for almost anyone. So when can we, when do we stop? When do we stop to create systems that are, as des not designers, that are not doing good, th but then, <laughs> do you know, I don't know how to express my question like fully, but then is there, there is a point where you have to stop. And yeah. Have to make is this a question about uh, complexity, like um, a system within a system or a system of a system or? I guess so. It's like if you create a system of um, symbols and then you keep on creating symbols of the same thing, but then you never stop and then everyone create this like different symbols for the same thing. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Then in this case, for example, like put it in the yellow, it was written in Spanish. It, if this product goes into another country, it can be read by anyone. There wasn't any symbol associated with it. So it makes it unusable and it makes it unrecyclable, for example. So this is an example, I think, of a, of a system that didn't work. How do you like, how do we as designer blo block this? Basically? Yeah. That's a very complex question. At Dark Matter Labs, there's a group that um, they analyzed uh, electrical bikes and they were, um, had a look at all the pieces that you need from, um, to, to, come, uh, to make one of these uh, this electric bikes. And what they found out is, uh, what we probably all know is that we live in a globalized world where every part comes from everywhere, which is a very fragile way of doing it as well. Because, of course, I mean, if you have countries that work for less, then it's economically it works. But the moment that one country um, is not able to produce anymore, you have a pro problem in the production chain. So um, this kind of system, or this what you're talking about, is very necessary because we live in this uh, globalized world but it's also very complex and very complicated and um, to solve. And um, so, yeah, I think that probably a big part of, uh, of design will be um, as well is just like to, to understand how this whole thing works. So uh, this, all this production chain or you were talking about the, the pictograms and the information so where is it going to land? What is going to happen with it? No, I mean, there's a, there's a huge 
thing about, I mean, there's also about recycling a huge thing, you know, if, if it, it wouldn't be better to have regrowable uh, or so to understand every material that we use uh, as, um, as a flow of things that can take different shapes and never ends up being waste. Um, because also recycling consu consumes energy. Um, and lots of the stuff is also not recycled, not, not even the clothes that we want to sell secondhand, they're used, that lots of it is just shipped to Ghana and burned there. So, um, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's huge. The moment that you ask this kind of questions and you dig deeper, the more complex it gets and the more frustrating as also it can become. And, but I think that's why it's also so important to have like a network of people that also think about these kind of things and they, they help you as well understanding these kind of things. And also just like, uh, I mean, now from my own experience talking as well, it's just like being in conversation with these people that are faced with the same kind of problems, just to chat with them about whatever, what, is also so important to keep on going, uh, just like the moral support you know, in between people. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a huge point of the thing. Hi, I f first of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a more general question. Uh, for example, if you look back um, when you first started your solo journey as an agency or freelance, what advice would you give to yourself? I think this question can help a lot of freelancers, like the ones that are starting. Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think maybe probably the, the best advice would be to be patient and that it's difficult to plan things and that certain things just emerge. And lots of it is just random. It's just like uh, si things that happen and you can't, you don't know that they are happening. I mean, maybe you can like uh, push, uh, you can, you can um, by moving in the right circles, like having the right people around you, you can help yourself a little bit uh, doing this. But it's, uh, uh, there's no recipe for it and you have to be patient. And also th I think at the end, uh, as trust is the most important thing in design when you want to work with clients, um, I think the best advice is to really meet the people and in, 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 in person, face to face, because the trust that you can establish when you have all your senses in your being with a person is totally different to the kind of trust that you get through social media. Um, so this is, I think, this is the, the, the advice that I would give. Just be around people that are good for you, that you are interested in, and be patient that it will happen. Um, don't, you don't need to worry about this. Thank you. <laughs> More questions? <laughs> Hello again. Um, you mentioned that your PhD, you worked on it for 11 years, which is such a substantial amount of time, well, more or less, but such a su substantial amount of time to dedicate to one project. And I feel like as designers, we don't have just a nine to five job, so it's very difficult to just switch our brain off. The question is essentially, how did you remain sane? When completing that, it, the answer may very well be you did not. Yeah. But how did you did you manage to maintain a work life balance at that point and in the recent years as well? Yeah, it's it's another really good question. Um, maybe first thing, maybe I'm not the best person to ask for it because I'm a workaholic and I I love to work. <laughs> I work too much, and then I get stressed out and. But I, I, I learned that I'm, uh, when I take my time and when I don't feel like doing something, then I now I stop doing it. So I just say, okay, now, if you're not having fun with it, then just leave it and then do it tomorrow. And um, I recognize that when I have fun with it, I can do the same thing that I would have done in eight hours. I can do it in one hour or two hours because I know I'm focused, I have fun, I know what I'm doing. 
Um, yeah. So this is um, this is uh, this is I think my my recipe now to have a little bit more sane relationship to work, coming from a very insane way of dealing with it. Um, yeah. And for the rest as well, I I mean it's like the, my biggest joy in life is actually learning new things. So every time that I feel like I'm doing something redundant that someone else already has done, or myself. I feel like I'm wasting my time, but if I'm learning something new, it could be anything, you know, it could be like a new recipe or it could be a program, it could be really silly thing, then I'm happy, then I made my day because I think, okay, I one step further. I don't know where I'm going, but I am one step further. So enjoy the, the process. The anticipation is often much better than really achieving something. Four, three, two, one. Thank you, Martin.